So it's Mari McInerney from Crokey here at the Oceana Tobacco Control Conference in Perth and I'm talking to David Thomas from talking about the Smokes project um, but also from elsewhere too. So can you just say where you're from David? Uh, so my name's David Thomas, I work at Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin and I lead the Talking About the Smokes project which is a very large national project which is uh, recently this year. Um, released its ba the baseline findings from this national project and we've talked about it here at the conference today. And can you talk through those findings and the fact that you said that they would have really major policy implications? Look, I think there's been a great deal of uncertainty about what is working and, and uh, in Aboriginal tobacco control and uh, are, are there improvements. I think it is now clear that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander smoking prevalence is coming down, so something is working. And the question is what is working and is it working similarly to, to the way it has worked in amongst other Australian smokers. Can we just talk briefly about the prevalence? What actually is it at the moment? 42%. Compared to? Uh, uh, it, it about sort of like less than 20% now. 14% is, yeah. is the national daily smoking rate. Okay, so you looked into what works and what doesn't work basically. Yeah, so we, we talked to 2,500 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander smokers around the country and we asked them a whole lot of things about smoking and quitting. You know, we talked to them for nearly an hour, each of them. Uh, and using a comparative survey, a, a survey that's comparable to another uh, survey that's been done with Australian smokers over the last decade, and so we were able to make comparisons. Uh, and we found a, a number of things. First of all, we found that uh, just like other smokers, Aboriginal smokers want to quit and know about the, wor the worst harmful effects of smoking. Um, we found that Aboriginal smokers are making quit attempts, but they're having trouble staying quit. At, uh, staying quit. Uh, we found uh, that um, this is of interest to, to, to health professionals. Um, uh, health Aboriginal people, are m Aboriginal smokers, are more likely than other Australian smokers to remember being advised to quit um, uh, by a health professional. And you know, we know that brief advice is one of the sort of cornerstones of um, clinical clinical practice. So, so that's that's certainly happening really well. So that's an important message. Um, but we also looked at sort of a, lot of, a lot of the big picture sort of like um, interventions around tobacco control, whether that's brief advice that I've mentioned, advertising, warning labels, smoke-free homes, and they all seem to work similarly to in the other pop in the rest of the population in amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Islander smokers, which suggests that really uh, tackling Aboriginal smoking is quite achievable. Um, the tools we have are likely to be very useful um, and you know obviously there, there will need to be some sort of tweaking of those tools and respectful tweaking of those in, in different Aboriginal communities and sort of local priorities are important but they're all likely to work. This is not something where we need to reinvent the wheel. What made you think that you would? As you said, I mean rates are higher but they are for a number of groups in the community that experience levels of disadvantage and you talked about how that there is, there were, you know, it broke the myth around Indigenous smoking and you know whether or not you could address it. Why, where did that, where was that myth? And um, okay. you, you also talked about the risks of that too. Yeah, okay. So like, look, this actually goes back before this project. Um, you know, the ABS has been uh, has provided estimates of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander you know, smoking prevalence going back to 1994, um, following the deaths in custody um, report. They did the first national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander survey, and they found that smoking prevalence was about 50%. Then, in sort of like the next two national surveys that they did, the number was again 50%. And this is at a time where smoking prevalence is falling in the in the overall Australian population, people are going, oh, what's so different here? In fact, and it's kind of a bit annoying, but if you looked at the small print of those those reports, they were comparing apples, oranges, and then grapefruits, um, in that they were looking at sort of like uh, current smoking, then they were looking at daily smoking, then they were looking at, um, and then they were looking at different age groups, you know, either 15 and over or 18 and over. And, you know, this is a period when people are starting to take up smoking. We did some reanalysis of that data and found, in fact, that smoking prevalence was coming down in parallel to the non-Aboriginal population. But, you know, 
the ABS reports had more inference perhaps than our journal article. And so it was a widely held, held belief that sort of like Aboriginal smoking was not coming down whilst um, Australian smoking was coming down, uh, total Australian smoking was coming down. So therefore, what had worked for other Australian smokers had not worked for Aboriginal smokers. Therefore, everything had to be done differently. It's not true. You said it also actually um, um, made it made Aboriginal communities themselves feel that there was nothing that they could do about it. It was sort of that it was normalised to a terrible degree. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, smoking is already somewhat normalised because you know so many people smoke. Mm. But you know, if you repeatedly say that nothing works for Aboriginal people, it, it leads to this sort of sense that nothing can be done, mm. uh, and that's. That's going to lead to sort of inertia, or people trying things that are probably unlikely to work because they feel they've got they can't use the things that have worked everywhere else in the world. So they try the things that are, are less proven, are less likely to sort of like you know prevent you know people to start smoking or to help them quit. Uh, and so we'll prolong the epidemic and the suffering and the, and, and the deaths that smoking causes. So what is your message then out of the project for what should be done? And I'll ask that in the context too that there has been a review of the Tackling Indigenous Smoking strategy that Tom Kalmer heads and that he talked about today uh, but via New York. Um, uh, within the context of that having been put in place by the coalition government and um, I'll throw in that um, I think the Tackling Indigenous Smoking um, funding was halved. Um, in that in the wonderful 2014 budget, um, what what is what are your recommendations sort of within that context? Okay, I mean, we certainly shared our results with the review of, of that program. Yeah, you know, there's been a great deal of uncertainty of funding for the the tackling indigenous smoking teams that have been around the country. Um, some very good people have left. Um, some of those, a lot of those programs have had their funding frozen so that as those people leave they've not been able to be replaced. So programs have gone down from staff, staff of six to one or two people with no certainty, very difficult, it's incredibly difficult to plan, you know, make work plans when you don't know how many staff you're going to have, whether the program will exist in the, you know, beyond the next couple of months. And that's been going on for a couple of years, it's been I mean, dreadful. And so a lot of that momentum and, and energy um, that was associated with the start of that program, you know, had, you know, has somewhat dissipated. We seem to be moving from that period of uncertainty, which is a great relief. I mean, obviously the funding cut in, in the 2014 budget um, it was a frustration as well. I mean, this is a really important issue that, you know, you know even the Minister, Minister Nash acknowledged this, you know, the leading preventable cause of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander death. Um, so, so you know we we're moving out of that uncertainty, and now we're sort of like you know everyone's got tenders in for you know keeping their regional tobacco team or to do something slightly different. Uh, there will be a national best practice unit. There will be evaluation as a program that these are things that Tom mentioned, but of course none of those none of those funding outcomes are, are, are known yet. And, I mean, he suggested they may be known by the end of the year. So we should move out of that uncertainty period. Um, that new teams will be funded around the country. They'll take a bit of time to get started. You know, this unit, um, whoever ends up doing it, you know, will, will take some time to get started. But we're probably moving into a new phase of a bit more certainty and a bit more planning. And I guess the message from the talking about the Smokes project is that really, I mean, a lot of these you know established tobacco control activities need to be a core part of you know what those teams are doing. Uh, there almost was a message at the start of the previous um, uh, program that go and reinvent the wheel, go and try whatever you like. I think we can move from that more intuitive approach to sort of like an evidence-based approach. And that was, I think, what um, Tom referred to today. Some of the things that prompted the review was the idea that people had, you know, that had shifted a bit to health promotion rather than a focus on tobacco. Is that what you mean with those? Oh, no. Um, you know, uh, the, the previous program had a very strong focus on public health approaches as against individual cessation approaches. And as, um, for example, Simon Chapman mentioned um, also at this conference, I mean, it has been those public health approaches in this country that have been so integral um, to uh, the decline in the Australian smoking prevalence, you know, whether that's been taxed, the, the mass media campaigns, the smoke free regulation, and of course, Plain Packs most recently. So 
So, so those are the sort of public health activities and, and health promotion activities, which I think are, abs are absolutely crucial. And you know, advertising is really important. Um, so, you know, in our in our work, we have found that sort of like those mainstream advertising campaigns work, um, do seem to to work. Um, but there is some complementary, you know, additional benefit of you know local Aboriginal uh, specific campaigns. Similarly, we found that warning labels seem to work. For example, you know, there's things on packs which you look at, you know, seven thousand times a year if you're if you're a smoker. Yes, um, you're giving a workshop tomorrow here, um, and you mentioned that um, you'll be talking about racism and the role in tobacco. Uh, at that, can you expand on that? Okay, so we did ask people whether they felt they'd been tr treated unfairly because they're an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, Islander person, um, you know, as one of the social determinants of, of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, which Ted Wilkes mentioned when he opened the conference. Um, and so we were able to look at the, the link between those and um, and smoking and quitting, and there's this really quite clear link between having been treated poor you know, unfairly because, because you're an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person and, um, you know, smoking and quitting, you know, we definitely found that. In terms of it being a reason that people smoke or that they also lack, uh, they're not given the same access to support to stop? Uh, no, we didn't find an associated association, for example, with smoke-free medicines or with birth advice, but we did um, find uh, associations with um, uh, making quit attempts. Uh, oh, sorry, we did find an association with medicines, but not with brief advice. Um, so it wasn't a, a uniform thing, but it, 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 it's certainly part of sort of like that experience of having been treated unfairly, you know, whether that's directly causative or it goes through, you know, feeling bad about yourself, being less able to sustain a quit attempt and, and make that extra, you know, do something that's hard and unpleasant, you know, give up cigarettes. Um, you know, there, you know, we don't know exactly the whole sort of chain of events of how it happens, but there certainly is an association. And, you know, I mean, in the past we've found an association, for example, you know, with being taken away and, and you know, uh, and you know, being a smoker. So, I mean, all these social determinants, they, they, they play out, you know, in different ways for different people and for Aboriginal people, uh, you know, important ways, you know, that they play out, which are not, not always the same as for other people are through racism and, and that colonial history. And one more question, if I could. Um, where Will you be revisiting um, talking about the smokes? Well, so what we're doing now, and, and you know, we, we did these baseline surveys and then we went back and, 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 and found as many of the people as we could uh, uh, and, you know, did the surveys with them again. And so now we can look at, you know, can compare what they said at, at baseline with then what happened, whether they made quit attempts or sustained quit attempts when we saw them in follow-up. And this will enable us to make much stronger sort of like statements about what what causes, you know, I mean causative associations without getting too technical. So, um, you know, we're busily trying to work through <laughs> through that data and we've, we've collected the data but it's now the, the, the not, not small task of, of analysing it and being being confident that we're not we're, we're making sort of like very defensible, you know, um, statements that can be used by practice and policy. And really, uh, and, and the other important thing is getting the message out from, you know, the results we've had to people on the ground so that these results are used. There's no point these things just sitting in an academic journal or a government report that's never released. Thank you very much, David. No worries.